Uh, we're going to move on to our second speaker today, who is Brian Schmidt from Tamarack Valley. And I'm really excited to have Brian here for a couple of reasons. Uh, I, I think he's been, he's had one of the most unsung hero stocks of the, um, of the patch because he just hasn't been able to get the respect that he deserved. His uh, M&A work that he's done has been absolutely fantastic. But the way he chooses to, to run his company in a very mature, responsible way is the, the, the high accretion doesn't happen until year two, year three, and the street gets frustrated. And I know, what I noticed here recently in the last uh, three months, when a lot of Canadian oil stocks took off, they were almost all the heavy oil stocks, from seniors to intermediates to juniors. They were the heavy oil stocks, the Athabascas, the, uh, the Cardinals, the Baytexes, the Suncors, the CNQs. Really, when I looked across my spectrum, the only light oil stock that had that kind of run was Brian's Tamarack. So I'm really happy to see this company get its due. Uh, I think the street has unfairly punished it for a long, long time. So we're going to get the full update here from Brian, and uh, we'll be listening and getting all our questions ready. Brian? Thank you, and uh, thanks for putting on this uh, conference. I think uh, it, it's great when uh, when we can get people like yourselves around, and we're able to tell to tell our story. So, um, as your normal disclaimers. Um, interestingly enough, we've had to put, add two pages of disclaimers on here. Uh, securities is getting uh, it's it's really it's quite a fascinating process. I won't go through it here in detail, but. Uh, it, is, uh, it is getting uh, tighter in how you define things. Uh, we can't, for example, use payout anymore in, in, uh, in our corporate presentations because that's a non-IFRS term. Uh, but I know how important some of those terms are to you, so I've included some of, those, uh, some of these slides in here anyway. Uh, but uh, that's, those are the kinds of questions we're getting. Uh, things like net back is not an IFRS term, uh, so that's, uh, they would rather us not use that as well. So it's, uh, it's interesting because these are very important aspects of our business. But that's why you see uh, a disclaimer list like that. Uh, just a bit about the uh, company and our history. Uh, we did a reverse takeover in 2010, uh, formed the company from a lot of ex-Apache. I used to run Apache Canada, uh, and my chairman, Floyd Price, uh, was president of Apache Canada before me. Uh, and then I decided that uh, I'd like to try something small. And I think one thing that uh, I'll tell you right now, the access to talent is unprecedented. I, I can't believe what kind of team you can put together. So there's some good things and bad things about down cycles. The good thing is uh, we've been able to uh, assemble a very, very talented team, both uh, ex-Apache, there's some ex-Bonavista guys in here, and uh, these are top, top talented uh, people I'm very, very proud of. Um, just uh, a couple of uh, uh, notes on the, on the sheet. Um, share price 394, I think we're up to 417 here or something today. Um, the, uh, uh, I think the important aspect here, beside the usual figures you might, you might realize, is that uh, Executive bought 840,000 shares, uh, uh, most of which occurred in December last year. So uh, we believe that there was a lot of upside value in the company. Uh, I'm going to show you a property here, Veteran, that uh, the reserves, uh, you're going to see that we're probably going to have year after year of reserve uplift because of its unique characteristics. Uh, we blacked out the staff until November when we released uh, preliminary reserve uh, numbers in a press release and then we were able to take the staff off blackout and a number of staff uh, uh, ended up buying, buying stock and we're still uh, buying stock today, both personally. Uh, and then you'll see there we instit instituted NCIB. Uh, if you believe your stock's undervalued, then, uh, then you ought to purchase it. We're still probably a turn or two under our peers. Uh, and if you look at our peers, uh, our stock relative to our peers, we've been increasing more relative to them, but our cash flow multiples are still below. And the reason for that is the cash flow in the company is going up faster than the analysts are able to uh, track it. So first three quarters of last year, uh, in total, we were cash flowed 45 cents a share. Uh, and in the fourth quarter, we are 25 cents a share. And the first quarter, we're, we're 26 cents a share. So. Uh, the, the cash flow per share number is, uh, is outpacing analysts' ability to, uh, to track it. Uh, very strong balance sheet, 0.8 times uh, debt to cash flow, and, uh, and uh, we're very proud of, uh, proud of that balance sheet. Puts us in good position. Uh, there's probably some 
uh, acquisitions that we could do. We were going to actually uh, free cash flow. Uh, I'll show you some budget numbers here, but we poured our budget at uh, $57 WTI, $56.75, and uh, we're, uh, you know, fair, fair ways above that. Uh, so we're going to generate probably about $30 million extra cash flow, still give, still give the shareholders a 10 to 15% debt-adjusted uh, per share cash flow uh, number increase, but uh, cash flow growth, but uh, our production growth, cash flow will be much higher, but um, uh, we'll still have excess cash after that. So we're probably going to look at uh, uses for that cash. The buyback is one of them, uh, but probably the primary use of extra cash would be to do tuck-ins around core assets uh, and, and use the extra cash that way. That's highly accretive. So I think hopefully uh, by year end we will announce uh, a deal uh, that we'll not issue equity for. We'll, um, we'll basically do it uh, within, uh, within our own balance sheet and our own excess cash. Uh, just talk a bit about uh, downturn. The next two slides actually talk about uh, downturn. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, we saw, we felt that this was going to be prolonged downturn. Uh, and there was a lot of naysayers. There was B recovery, we're going to be best by fall and, and uh, of 15. And, and we absolutely cut our capital to zero, no drilling the first half of 15. Uh, and you go tell your shareholders that, that you're a growth company, you're not going to put growth on the table. Uh, that's a tough pill to take. But if the one thing that you can trust us on is that we're going to take a long-term view in the company, and we learned a lot of things through Apache, how to preserve balance sheet and downside and, and take advantage of that balance sheet and the upside, and that's exactly what we've done here. So with no uh, drilling in, in uh, first half 15, we actually paid down debt, and a lot of people were getting into some serious debt uh, in that first six months. Um, then our engineers have time to look at uh, well design, we were drilling one mile cardium wells, doing about 18, 20 stages, and we got into drilling two mile cardium wells, 115, 120 stages. The economics of that uh, are, are robust, even at $45 uh, crude. So once you get your engineers focused on uh, correcting, uh, you know, some designs, refining designs, you become competitive. Now with a strong balance sheet and sustainable at low prices, uh, you can look to add in assets. And the assets we added, we added uh, Penny and the Lethbridge area. We added uh, Husky Wilson Creek. And then uh, most notably, uh, last November, uh, a $400 million deal with, uh, with Spur, uh, November of uh, 16, or uh, which closed uh, January 17. So just a couple of, uh, a couple of points here. Uh, that, uh, if you look then, Q1 2015, we were 2.2 times debt to cash flow, 8,000 barrels a day. Uh, now Q118, we're 0.8 times debt to cash flow, 23,000 barrels a day. That's a tremendous amount of growth in a down cycle in, in a tough time, and it uh, goes to the discipline that I just described to you about about a recipe in uh, in uh, in low oil prices. Um, so how's that strategy working? Uh, we had another production beat uh, in in Q1. Q4 was a production beat, so was Q1, and I think uh, uh, analysts have gone to expect that we, we probably will beat our production. We set our internal targets and we do the street uh, numbers uh, and uh, their internal targets are uh, affected. They affect employees bonus. So there's pretty uh, strong motivation, mo motivation to hit your numbers. Um, I think the thing that the street didn't expect was a strong liquids weighting. And uh, I will tell you this company is unique because the more money we spend, the higher the net back because we're deploying capital on wells that are roughly about 80% uh, oil, and our corporate uh, uh, balance, our corporate is 63%. So uh, I think that puts us in a unique uh, position, and very few analysts pick that up. The primary uh, beat is due to the Viking assets we acquired in 2017. Uh, we're replacing our inventory. We got about nine years, uh, nine and a half years of inventory, which I think is about right. Uh, too much inventory, you got a lot of PV value there. You need to do something with. Uh, so I, I think, um, and we've been replacing year on year. Our net backs improved 31% over Q1 17, 13% uh, from increasing the oil weighting and cutting operating costs and 18% uh, by, uh, by uh, higher oil prices. Uh, here's our production split, um, about 11,600 uh, out of the Viking. That's the, that surpassed the uh, cardium in, in Q4. Uh, cardium's gro growing too. I'll show you a slide on this. Uh, eight, 
8,800. Just a note on that Viking, we bought that asset at 6,200 uh, and 52%. So in one year, we've increased the oil weighting 20% by drilling uh, oil weighted wells on that property and increased uh, the, the uh, production uh, almost twofold. The capital split, 42% to a Viking, 32% to, Vi to uh, the Cardium. That's going to continue uh, as we, uh, about the same as we go forward. I mentioned the guidance, uh, uh, 22,500 to 23,500, uh, 64 to 66% liquids, and that'll give you about a 15%, 10 to 15% debt adjusted production per share growth. Um, the exit production will be 24, 24, 5. Uh, and capital expenditures will be in around that 200 million um, uh, within the field netbacks that we've uh, put forward. Um, year end debt, uh, in fourth quarter annualized will be less than one times debt to cash flow. Assumptions, as I mentioned, 56.75 WTI. Uh, only about 18% of our uh, cash flow comes from the gas side. So even though we've seen some depressed prices, it doesn't affect the company that much. Plus, we've also di um, diverted from ACO hub into other hubs where the pricing is, is better. Um, down to the cash flow sensitivities, uh, the first three really aren't in your control. I can't control FX, but one thing I can control is the weighting in the company, oil weighting in the company. And for every 1% change in oil weighting, we get about 3 million. Uh, so it's pretty important for the company to continue uh, to focus on that, on that going forward. Um, if uh, anybody's doing any modeling, uh, we put all the information. Uh, we're very transparent with our shareholders on, on what our numbers look like. But you can see here, Q118, our adjusted operating field net back is, uh, is 2764. And uh, that's, that's the highest uh, net back the company has, has really had in our, in our history. Just uh, to zero in on those netbacks a little further, uh, you'll see that the uh, price has changed, so your netback's going to fluctuate with it. Um, a better way to look at it is prob what percent of Edmonton par are you getting as netback? And uh, we've increased that from 33% to 40%, uh, mainly through the cost cutting. Um, I will tell you that uh, the netback, uh, GMP had an analysis done on netback at 63% uh, oil weighting. Uh, we had the second highest netbacks amongst 11 peers, second highest, and a lot of those other peers were in the 80s in terms of their oil weighting. And the analysts were wondering, well, how did you get that high netback with, with, um, with oil weighting around 63? And the reason is it's a very low cost structure, uh, number one, and number two, our oil is light and fetches the highest price. Uh, it's not like a medium Saskatchewan crude or, or uh, very little heavy, and so that, uh, that gets us maybe a, a two or three dollar off Canadian off of uh, off of Edmonton Par. That's it. Um, just how have we done on the? Uh, I mentioned cost. Uh, I just love this chart because uh, things that are in your control. Uh, we've cut costs overall uh, 23 uh, percent since the start of the downturn. Um, you can see 1368. Uh, going to 1095 on our lifting costs. Uh, what's significant about that is the oil weighting went up. And usually when oil weightings go up, your lifting costs go up because now you have pump jacks to maintain and, and workovers to do. And, and we, we not only uh, kept, that, uh, kept that in check, we uh, cut costs from there. And so now we're down to that uh, 1095. Actually, 1076, I think, was our, our Q number, Q1 number. And uh, you can see G&A. 311, cut that down to $1.60. Uh, I don't know of too many companies our size are running run with 37 staff. Um, I, I know one such peer company that probably is slightly bigger than us and has 10 times the staff. Um, and so we do a lot through software development. Uh, if you can stop engineers making spreadsheets and trying to reconcile with the accountants, that cuts a, a lot of time off. And uh, it's things like that that have really made the difference plus the talent that we've uh, we brought into the company. Uh, we do hedge. I won't go into detail here. We're not heavily hedged right now, but we like to keep about 30% uh, of our uh, production hedged. And um, uh, we've been actively, actively uh, uh, doing a few hedges here in the last little while as the uh, backwardation has changed on the curve, on the uh, strip curve. Bit on uh, production and, and the areas, Wilson Creek Cardium, you can see good stable growth through a downturn. Probably gonna keep this, uh, this flat. 
uh, the, uh, um, it's been a phenomenal asset. Coming into the downturn, we were 1,300 barrels a day, mostly gas when we bought it from Suncor. And uh, now we're up around that 9,000 uh, BUEs a day. It's been a, a great asset. Uh, it'll continue to grow. We started with 44 sections of land here. We now have over 300. And we got nine years of drilling uh, inventory, year and a half payback or less. Now, you're gonna hear me talk about year and a half all the time, payback. Guys will come up here and have a three-year payback and they'll show you uh, that they have lots of inventory. Three-year payback is an unsustainable company. You need to be in that year and a half to two years. I make sure it's a year and a half just to put some discipline in the system. So I don't even count inventory unless it's got a year and a half payback. And uh, that is about an 85 to 100 percent rate of return half cycle. An 85 to 100 percent rate of return half cycle. By the time you load in land, seismic, GNA, all the abandonment costs, everything like that, you're probably going to turn that 80 percent, 85 percent project into about a 35 percent full cycle. At 35 percent full cycle, I can give you the per share numbers that you're expecting and I can have uh, excess uh, cash flow. Uh, what's new in the cardium? Uh, this is uh, everyone who's been tinkering with fracks and, and, and we found out you can go overboard. <laughs> There's uh, in the good rock, we're finding that the increased density of frac doesn't get you uh, any more production or any more reserves, negligible production, certainly no, res no reserves. So you can see the slide on the, uh, on the left is an area where we've got tighter biotubrated zone uh, rock, uh, that's the brown, and it's got uh, a little bit of the high 9% uh, good quality rock. And in that stuff, you, you, if you double the fracs, you're gonna get double the production. It works, it works pretty good. So that's where we're doing the 115 stage uh, two mile wells. Now if you look on the right curve, uh, now you've got a zone that's got you know, a lot of nine to, nine to 15% porosity rock, uh, very little bioturbated, and uh, in that you're getting virtually nothing for extra fracs. So we can save, bottom line, these, these miles, typically we've got a mile of good rock, a mile of bioturbated, you're gonna be, uh, we'll tailor the fracs. So we'll do the first part with less fracs. The toe maybe is tighter, we'll do it with more fracs. Uh, that'll save us about 300 grand a well and we're not really gonna impact our production or our reserves. Talk about the, uh, this, this, this field is uh, so exciting. I gotta tell you guys, I'm trying to figure out if this is the best acquisition I've done in my career uh, or it certainly is the best acquisition that, uh, that Tamarack has done, and it's the acquisition of Spur Resources. Um, there was, uh, y you can see the map sheet, we have lands in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, you can see the production build. Notice that production is going up, but the gas is not. The gas is staying flat, but the oil production is uh, increasing substantially. In fact, uh, this well by this area by the end of Q4 will be double the production that we, uh, uh, under which we bought it at. And uh, most of that effect is, of course, is the oil. We drilled 28 wells in uh, Q1. Takes very little, very few wells to build production here, and I'm gonna explain why that is. Nine years of drilling inventory, very rich, about 14 million barrels per section. There's about 1.1 million barrels of uh, oil in place uh, on these lands. Here's a zoom up of the far west uh, uh, area we called Veteran. Uh, you can see a, a rather unique a well configuration, and that's for a reason I'll go into in a minute. Um, if you look at the 415 million acquisition costs plus the investment we put in, it's about 52,000 in the flowing we paid for it. Not bad. That's a very good price. In fact, uh, in that 52,000, I didn't even include the cash flow that was coming out of that uh, in the first year we drilled it. So uh, we're very pleased with this acquisition. What I like about this is it's uh, sitting at about 1.6% recovery. That's it. Um, and so a lot, whereas Suncor, I added on a lot of sections on the tuck-ins. Here, you just have to do the work on the asset itself. We think we can get another 6% on primary, another 7% on water flood. You don't hear too many people talking about water flood in the Viking because typically it's too tight. But we have a unique situation here that uh, gives us quite an advantage. So 815 million barrels uh, and a, and a you know, 14, 15% recovery. There's a lot of run, run, uh, runway on this asset. Um, why is this different? So. On the chart on the right, uh, you're gonna see that uh, there's an upper Viking, it's very tight. That's typically what everybody has. It's 5, uh, 0.5 to 5 millidarcies of permeability. 
uh, and the depletion strategy on those, on those kinds of zones is you just keep putting wells in. And there's very little well interference because it's so tight. And so you can do 16, uh, some guys are even trying 32 wells a section, depending on your length. So uh, that's a very normal depletion strategy. You end up with high decline wells as they pull off, but you just keep your production by, by hammering the wells in. In our particular area, we have a lower Hamilton Lake zone. That is about 200 millidarcies of permeability. So fluids move through that quite easily. And so our depletion technique is to drill in the upper, frack down into the Hamilton Lake, use that Hamilton Lake to pressure support uh, your well, and you get a totally different decline picture. Remember I said it takes less wells here to build production, and the reason is is you're not faced with high declines. There's, um, you can see uh, the old water flood in the Hamilton Lake, the injectors are the circles on there, and uh, the injection water doesn't want to go across the path. It wants to follow the natural fractures and connect uh, all the injectors up. So the depletion strategy we had was to change the orientation to drill between those railroad tracks, avoid uh, water, uh, and use the water to sweep across and uh, up into your well bore. And so we're getting some uh, amazing results uh, because of that. Now one thing I'll tell you, uh, in the build-in production here, um, we're going to, uh, we did sign a deal with Gibson's to run a 120 kilometer pipeline up to Hardesty. Uh, that gives you the confidence that we, we believe that there's a lot of resource here to go after. Uh, that will start up in uh, January 2019. That will cut our, uh, our operating costs corporately by about 50 cents a barrel. So when you have that kind of decline, what happens? And you can see here, uh, I plotted all industry uh, companies and my peers. Uh, National Bank did this for me. You can see all the other companies below our type curve, except for the one yellow one on top. That's the white cap. They have some very good wells. Everybody else IP or lower. But the one thing you notice is that the decline is much different. And, um, uh, you, and be, when that decline is different, uh, you can build production easier. In fact, if you have the Hamilton Lake, your decline, first year decline on a well, not corporate, on a well is 30%. Your first year decline, if you don't have the Hamilton Lake of all those operators is 62%. It's double the decline rate. So uh, with, there's only 85 wells drilled last year, took the product in, on all the Viking, there was probably about 65 here. You can see that the production went from 300 barrels a day we expanded the battery because it was only good to 1750. We, we expanded it to 5,000 barrels a day, and then that wasn't good enough. We couldn't get our Q1 production. We expanded it to 10,000 barrels a day. And, uh, and that's a, that's tr you can see there's not a lot of gas in that. It's uh, a lot of oil. And just to let you know, uh, these are spruel type curves uh, for the area. Y you can see that uh, um, this is, you can't, you can't imagine how different this, this production is. In fact, the best spruel type curve were more than double the best spur type curve after 365 days because of that less decline. Uh, this I won't go, th go through in detail. Uh, it's, it, we put our goals uh, we have internally for you. You can see, you don't have to flip back through my old presentation see what I said I was gonna do and compare to what I did it, I do it, I do it here. Uh, I just want you to know, uh, the only thing I want you to take from this is that we have less we had, we had a production beat last year with fewer wells than we planned. Uh, and that's because of this phenomenon I just uh, described to you. So in summary, uh, the results speak for themselves. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, and it's mainly because of the acquisition of Spur Viking, less decline, increased corporate performance. We're building debt adjusted production per share. Netback continues to uh, improve through organic growth and more cu cost cuts. And we think that the valuation share price will follow as analysts uh, catch up. Thank you. Uh, I take any questions. You know what, in, on the veteran, uh, on the veteran we're about eight months payback. And my guess is you're probably a two year payback with, um, on two times. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's just uh, because you still have a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, as you saw in that chart, a lot of production, much uh, well over and above Spruill's best type curve. Well, I think I think the um, uh, I, I personally think that it's very difficult to get your head around issue and paper at this lowest stock price, and so I think the company is better served if we did a, uh, an acquisition within balance sheet, and and you just let your free cash flow uh, build that way. There are some attractive larger packages there, um, and and we have a look at everything. So you may hear rumors around town that, gee, it's Tamarack's in the, in the we, we look at everything because there's a lot of stuff you learn in those data rooms. And it, it does give you a free look at, uh, at technology that other people are using. Um, but I, I would more, I, I'd say, well, in, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you guys, uh, Ron and I have one of our goals is to do a tuck in within balance sheet by year end. That's, uh, my bonus is tied to it. So you, you, you can probably... You can probably tick that one off. <laughs> so it's, I'd rather do those and the accretion numbers on a per share basis. And we're, we're bonused as well on, on per share numbers and send it on per share, debt adjusted. So um, I, I, think, I think we're one of the, I think we're unique. In fact, I, I know consultants tell me that our bonus system and the way we compensate our employees is unique in the patch. It, it's and I think for shareholders, it's probably more aligned than than you would agree anyone else's is. Yes. Yes. Well, like I said, that veteran uh, at eight eight months payback is uh, on the fifty seven fifty budgeted price. So uh, you're probably going to be about four to se four to six months somewhere in there. And then on the on the cardiums, you're going to be about that 1.4 at 57.50. You're going to be about probably one year, 1.1 year. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I'm glad you glad you asked that. Um, uh, the the question is, uh, uh, has have the reserve evaluators taken into account? We don't use Spruill, we use GLJ, so they got a little bit different process. Okay, but the question is, is this, have the reserve evaluators captured the upside in that in that curve? Uh, and uh, uh, in our in our opinion, no, because. With such little production history, when the reserves were done, the, the GLJ goes to volumetrics. So they'll basically say, okay, I don't care how well you're, you're well IPs, I don't care how, if, it, if it's running for four or six months, I'm only going to give you 7% on primary or 5% on primary, whatever the number is, depending on the rock. And they, they, won't, they won't look at well performance unless it's got a year of production. So my guess is next year, They'll look at some improved production on these on these uh, wells, and we're probably going to get credit. They'll start switching it over from volumetrics into into well declines, and that's where we'll get the uplift. Plus, I didn't mention it. We are going to put injectors in Veteran. We'll be drilling seven injectors in here, so we will keep the pressure up in the Hamilton Lake, and that's all in that capital flowing metric of twenty thousand. All the water flood capital is in that flowing metric. Uh, 